day nine of our frameworks course. What is partial knowledge of God? Hopefully you can see that this flows from the study we had yesterday about God not playing games and not only revealing a fake version of himself or an incomplete version of himself to his people in the Old Testament or at any point in history. Uh, but it flows naturally from that. We don't know everything there is to know about God. Uh, none of us would claim that. So if we don't know everything, what does it mean to only know something? What are the first things that we put in place that we then build on in our Christian life? Uh, hopefully you'll enjoy some noises off to uh, remind you that there are quite a lot of children running around during the day. Uh, hopefully that's not going to distract us from this crucial question of uh, where you begin and then build from. And a striking thing, and this is really the beginning of quite uh, major uh, changes in the way we talk, if perhaps not the way we think, it's more a case of discovering what we already knew but never really articulate or uh, regularly reflect on as we read the Bible. Um, we know that saying God is confined to Mercury uh, or God is a magic flying spaghetti monster as some atheist forums love delighting in, well we know that's a false understanding of the God of the Bible. But are we willing to say that God being just one person uh, on his own is an equally ludicrous thing, equally blasphemous thing to say about the living God? Or put it another way, do we think of the Trinity as advanced level stuff about God, best avoided in ordinary life and conversation? Uh, the Bible doesn't allow us to think that way at all. Uh, when uh, you had a chance to do that quite detailed homework or uh, exercise on the second page, uh, just speaking about each of these three, these fundamental three who are at the heart of the one God. When we say, well, what is distinctively the case about the Father? What is distinctively the case about the Son? What is distinctively the case about the Holy Spirit? I hope you found that enlightening and reassuring. Actually, we do know things that are unique to the three, even as we consider them as the one God. Uh, some things that I wrote down. Uh, this Jesus calls God his Father. Uh, he lives in the power of the Spirit. Everything he does is by the power of the Spirit, not his own power. Um, he asks the Father to send the Holy Spirit on our behalf, as all that uh, John 14 to 17 discusses. He was born weak clearly thirsting, hungering, needing to depend on others and uh, depend on taking food into himself in order to live. He is light and the truth and the way and the life. Again, John 1, John 14. Um, he is the gate from John 10. He's the bread of life from John 6. He's the resurrection and the life from John 11. He's our great high priest uh, from Hebrews he prays. That's worth thinking about. God praying. Uh, he regularly speaks in ways that people can understand and hear. He dies on the cross. He heals in the power of the Spirit. Creation obeys him when he asks creation to do things. He's the Son of Man. That's the title that he's given. Uh, he's appointed by his father to judge. He's obviously physical. People touch him, shake his hand, slap him on the back and actually hurt him when we come to Good Friday. Uh, he was transfigured. So what people saw of him on earth was not all there was to him. Well, what about the father? Uh, he calls Jesus his son with an audible voice at his baptism and at the Mount of Transfiguration and at one other point in John's Gospel. He creates the world through the Son. He is unseen. No one has ever seen him. No human has ever seen him except the man Christ Jesus. He sends the Spirit. Jesus asks him to send the Spirit, but Jesus himself doesn't send the Spirit. Uh, the Father does that. Uh, he is the one that we and Jesus pray to. If you think about the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, when you pray, pray to the Father your father, my father in heaven. 
Uh, he's the source of everything. From the Father comes everything. Uh, he entrusts everything to Jesus and he's delighted with Jesus. Whenever uh, anyone hears from him, he's always saying, well, look at Jesus. He's my son who I love. Isn't he brilliant? That's the thing the Father always seems to be saying. Uh, the Spirit, uh, he unites the Father and the Son. If you think about John 17 and the way uh, Jesus describes the Holy Spirit and in Luke's gospel, how he's full of the Spirit and that uh, empowers him to do everything that he does. Uh, the Spirit's poured upon Jesus by the Father. Um, the Spirit fills the Son and his church. He empowers the Son and the church. The Spirit is the one of the Trinity who fills the universe. The Father is in heaven. The Son is now in heaven and until then was walking around. But the Holy Spirit, well, he's everywhere. He goes wherever he likes. Uh, he's like the wind, Jesus says in John 3, that he blows wherever he pleases. Uh, and you can't control him or uh, predict where he's going to be at any one time. He gives new birth to Christians. Again, John 3, huge amount of this. You can just get from John's gospel. He gives gifts. Uh, those, uh, Joel, uh, the end of Joel uh, 2, pouring out uh, the Spirit so that there are gifts and visions and dreams and uh, prophesying. Uh, also the 1 Corinthians passage or the Ephesians 4 passage that talk about the Holy Spirit uh, being uh, the means by whom the Father and the Son give gifts. Uh, the Spirit baptises, uh, and actually Jesus is described as baptising by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Spirit raises Jesus from the dead. Uh, so you have, even from those quite familiar passages, I don't know how many of those are familiar to you, you have quite a different picture of these different uh, three persons of the Trinity. Um, it wouldn't really be appropriate to speak of the Spirit dying on the cross for us. Uh, it wouldn't be appropriate to speak of the Father being poured out on all the church. It wouldn't be appropriate to think of Jesus as the source of everything. He says he isn't. He says the Father is the source of everything. Um, so already, uh, just from a, a short study, um, I wonder where you got to, um, just from what you can remember of the Bible. Um, we have not one sort of on his own deity with lots of omni words, uh, apparently omnipotent, and yet Jesus dies on the cross. Um, apparently everywhere, and yet Jesus is in one place at one time. Um, apparently knowing everything, and yet Jesus doesn't know when he's going to return. Uh, we, we don't have all these problems that are created by beginning with this abstract definition of God. Uh, we start with God as he reveals himself uh, through Jesus to be Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit, one God. Um, so this uh, divine nature that uh, we're asked to write down, say, well, if we had to boil uh, the essence of the living God down into just one sentence, what would we say? Um, well, I, I went for three and see if you agree with this. And if you don't, let's enjoy talking on Sunday. All things are from the Father, through the Son, in the power of the Spirit. The unseen Father is revealed through Jesus in the power of the Spirit. And the Father loves the Son in the unity of the Spirit. So actually, when, when we talk about God, that's what we mean. That, that's the beginning. Father, Son and Spirit uh, working in this way, loving each other, creating, uh, revealing. And if we come to Romans 1, which I think was mentioned in the Sunday evening, where we kind of think, well, even people who aren't Christians have a rough idea of God. Um, Romans 1 doesn't actually say that. It says that even God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, which we must say is the Holy Spirit, that's how he exercises his power, and his divine nature, which we must say is Trinitarian, have been clearly seen from what is made. We don't get a generic God from looking at creation. We get a Trinitarian God, one who is both seen and physical and unseen and uh, non-physical, existing only in that spiritual heavenly reality. And we can see that this God is active in the world in all kinds of ways. So he has a Holy Spirit uh, through whom he does things 
and uh, is able to be present and active and powerful. Uh, the issue is not that people don't get that. The, people, the issue is, Romans 1, that people suppress that, that they prefer to go after an idea of God as all-powerful, um, as someone we can be enslaved to or rebel against, uh, to take that little Jürgen Moltmann quotation. Uh, the, the God of theism and the God of atheism, neither of them are the real God. Uh, what an extraordinary thing to be meditating on. What an exciting thing to be meditating on as we look through the scriptures. Um, looking forward to discussing this in person. Uh, there's just uh, one, uh, two more studies before we get to meet again uh, Saturday and Sunday, uh, days 10 and 11.